Well, welcome everybody to today's uh, uh, IHR online seminar. Um, and uh, very pleased to continue a uh, uh, trend this term of having international seminars with uh, colleagues uh, from around the world. And uh, today, looking at uh, some of the history of education in Brazil. Delighted also to have the opportunity to, to welcome back uh, very old friends of the Institute who, who visited uh, the Institute um, oh, over the last 10 years, or, uh, um, which has been uh, lovely. So, so welcome back to Maria and uh, Amarillo. It's um, Professors Marissa Bittar and Amarillo Ferreira Jr. And today they'll be uh, talking with us about colonization and Jesuit education in Brazil. And so I'll pass over to them and uh, they'll uh, be speaking for about 40 minutes and then there'll be time for discussion. Over to you. Okay, Gary, thank you so much. Nice to see you and to be with you, colleagues from the IOE and the other who are here in this meeting. Thank you so much. Well, colonization and Jesuit education in Brazil is an old subject to which Amarillo and I have been dedicated for many, many years. Few researchers in Brazil studied, so we are very grateful to the IOE for this invitation. We hope to present it today as best we can. Our presentation will consist of five point, points, as you see. So we are talking about these points, conclusions, and then if you have uh, uh, any questions, we will be very grateful to, to you. Colonization and the learning, the catechism, the catechism were two processes that emerged together in colonial Brazil. In view of this, before addressing the question of the kind of education that was practicing during the colonization, we present here the, distinct, the distinctive features of the structure of the colony, as you can see. Of these five uh, characteristics, we would like to emphasize uh, the concentration of land in a few owners, slavery, and the work of the Jesuits to Christianize, to Christianize, to Christianize Brazil. So here we, I have some, I put some uh, um, important uh, political uh, events as our independence and uh, our independence and uh, the slavery that uh, abolished in 1888. So it was too late compared to other American uh, countries. During the 60th and the 70th centuries, conversion to Christianity was linked with learning the first letters. In these first centuries, the school was simply called a house or a brotherhood of young pupils. The 60th century in Brazil was characterized by a majority of Indians and a minority of Europeans. From this century, a large number of people from Africa began to form a sizable workforce. These numbers here can give us an idea about the ethnic composition of Brazilian population in that time, but they are not precise because the first demographic census only took place in Brazil in 1872. So this is approximated. For a, compar for a comparison, uh, with the present, uh, I would like to, to add that now in two, 2019, 42 of the Brazilian population declared themselves white, 46% brown, 9% black, and 1% indigenous or yellow people. 
genetically, Brazilian population remains miscegenated, and our main anthropologist, Darcy Ribeiro, says that being mestizo is a blessing. Now, why Portugal chose the company of, Jes of Jesus to catechize Brazil? Here in Brazil, we don't say society of Jesus. We, say, we use it to say company of Jesus. Uh, some Christian people say that company of Jesus means to be with Jesus. So we use more company of Jesus than society of Jesus in, in our culture. This is an important question, why the society of Jesus was chosen by Portugal. And why the, is this important? This is important since in the pre-colonial period, the Franciscans were the first to practice Christianity in the colony, including our first mass which was conducted by uh, a Franciscan uh, father. The Society of Jesus was founded in 1540 in response to disputes between Protestant reformers and the Catholics in the old continent. And as a result of its effort to combat reformist, reformist tendencies was chosen by the Portuguese monarchy to carry out missionary work in its new colony. So the Portuguese crown asked the Society of Jesus to establish the Catholic faith among the indigenous people as a way to prevent the religious reforms that were taking place in Europe from reaching Brazil. The Jesuits established catechesis created the first schools and exercised a long hegemony in Brazilian education uh, from 1549 to 1759. Unlike the Lutherans, Anglicans, and the other reformers, the Jesuits did not establish literacy schools for everyone in Brazil. Initially, the Jesuits tried to Christianize the adults Indians, but later they realized that they should get better results with children. Uh, at this point, Amarillo would like to add something to this uh, information. Please, Amarillo. I would like to add a few questions that I still think are relevant. The Jesuit pedagogical strategy with adult indigenous peoples failed because they were resisted to abandoning element of their culture and the incorporation of the Catholic Christian faith. The many cultural elements of the indigenous peoples that inhabit, inhabit, inhabited the west coast of Brazil were the following. Polygamy, nudity, anthropophagy, were between tribals, not Christian religious rituals, and the nomads. The Jesuits considered that all these indigenous culture elements were sinful, that would have to be fought. Marisa. Okay, so the Jesuits start a new strategy uh, when they realized that they would get better results with children. Therefore, they started to practice this new strategy, the education of children. At this point, we think that it is important to emphasize that Jesuit education in Brazil began to take place in connection with two important factors of modernity. The first one, the worldwide role of the Society of Jesus in the creation of schools in the whole world. The second um, characteristic, the birth of the feeling of childhood 
and the awareness of the need of the need for children to be separated and protected from the adult world. So the pedagogy of the Jesuits in the colony was in line with such a trend in the European modernity. In the specific case of Brazil, the Jesuit letters show the frustrations in converting adult indigenous peoples, which led the Jesuits to realize the advantage of first conquering the child's soul, and then it would constitute an obstacle to the bad behaviors of their parents. Now let's uh, let's talk about, uh, in, in our view, the most interesting um, practices of the Jesuits here in Brazil, which was the improvisation and the adaptation. Based on the letters of the Jesuits, we are now going to talk about these improvisations, adaptations, and even the transgressions that they practiced in order to reach their goal which was to Christianize the entire population in Brazil. Their own letters show that during all 210 years of their mission in Brazil, the Jesuits preferred not to obey dogmas as this would not help them at all in the task of, converse, of conversion. They were absolutely sure about that. So at, at the very beginning, they adapted the principles of the society of Jesus to the environmental conditions that surrounded them. In our previous studies, Amarila and I described this distinct practice as being a pedagogia brasilica. This is not a Brazilian pedagogy. This is different because brasilica, this term means this term refers to both indigenous people and their things. So Brasilica pedagogy was the first uh, pedagogy here in Brazil with these features uh, concerning to indigenous uh, culture and their things. Well, here we here I would like to to emphasize that when um, uh, when slave uh, people uh, start becoming uh, growing here in Brazil, um, they were uh, they were Christianized too, and we can found uh, in the sermons of the Father Antonio Vieira who maybe was the most uh, intellectual of all the Jesuits who mis mission here. And these sermons uh, uh, are a very important um, piece of uh, the, the conversion uh, Africans to Christianity. Uh, to catechize uh, all the people here in Brazil, Father Anchieta, José Anchieta, who was uh, made, the first one who tried to, to practice education in, the, in, in a very structured uh, form. So Father Anchieta, José de Anchieta, wrote the first catechism and prepared a grammar book in the Tupi language. He designed a didactic system which made use of theater as a ludic instrument of learning. Besides that, Anchieta wrote plays with the purpose of converting indigenous people to Christianity. So drama was introduced at the same time as the occupation of the territory by the Portuguese. The plays were staged in the villages and in the colleges, in, in schools, I mean. As well as the single act plays, there were comedies and the tragedies, and all of them had a moral purpose. 
In Anchieta plays, Christianity was assimilated by taking account of the values of the Indians themselves, observing their customs, and being aware of the ludic features of their culture. This involved adopting practices centered on music, dancing, and the tribal life, which was full of rituals, movement, color, and sounds. So music, dancing, games, and pastimes were used by the Jesuits who deprived them of their real significance by refining them and replacing their symbology with a Christian interpretation. In this same period, the popular festivals in Catholic Europe were no longer well regarded as Peter Burke shows that during the 16th century, cultured people, in particular reformers in general, whether Catholic or Protestant, endeavored to alter the values and the attitudes of the, the people. They objected to certain forms of a popular religion, such as sermons, and above all, opposed the religious festivals. They saw in popular culture the vestiges of paganism and the signs of pre-Christian practices. practices. The Anchieta plays were an auxiliary feature in the teaching of the catechism that combined an incantatory power with didacticism, which proved to be effective with a new public that was ignorant of theology. Between 1564 and 16, uh, 1598, José Anchieta wrote about 20 plays in uh, Tupi uh, language, in Yangatu language, which was a general uh, language practice in, in the coast of Brazil. It was uh, to be spoken uh, by, uh, uh, by Portuguese, so a to be with uh, the, the, the Portuguese characteristics and the Portuguese itself. So these three languages uh, were present in, in José de Anchieta plays. The task of transposing then Brazilian people, it's bilingual, uh, bilingual, it's a Portuguese and the Nyangatu, the, the, ling the language, the general language. The general language of the colony, the coast, in the coast of Brazil, this, yeah. uh, this, uh, this language predominates. Uh, the task of transp transposing uh, the Catholic message into indigen indigenous speech required an ability to penetrate the imaginary world or of another culture, and this was the ambition of José de Anchieta. For example, how can the Tupi find a word for sin if they have no notion of this concept? So what is sin? For a Tupi, what is seen for the indigenous people? Anchieta was thus adapting their mythological figures to Christian representations by creating a strange and syncretic imaginary world. For this reason, the new spiritual represent representation thus produced was neither Christian theology nor a Tupi belief, but a third symbolic sphere, a species of parallel mythology that only the colonial situation could make possible. From the 17th century onwards, as the indigenous population decreased because, because wars or diseases, the Jesuits left catechesis in the background and began to give preference 
to schools for white children. At the same time, with the increase in the slave population, Brazilian... Marisa, but, white what? child, Marisa, white child in this case, it's sons of the owners. Land, land, land hours. Yes. The, yes, in this case, white, white children were this, or miscegenous people uh, called in Brazil mamelucos. Mamelucos were children uh, mixed. Uh, in, in January, uh, the mother was Tupi and the father was a Portuguese. Uh, and then these children were the object of the conversion and white people from, uh, um, from uh, mother and the father of Portuguese, in the, both cases, but just for a uh, few children, not for everybody. I think this was what you would like to clarify, Amarillo. Is, is this correct? Okay? Okay. So, okay. Well, so at the same time with the increase uh, in this uh, in this slave population, Brazilian Catholicism began to incorpor incorporate African culture and religious and its religious elements. This way of understanding and practicing Catholicism in Brazil from them came to be called religious syncretism which is the essential mark of Brazilian Catholicism until today. Now we are going to our conclusions. I don't know if I, I, am, I am so fast, I am a little bit um, concerned about my presentation, but please, then if you have questions, we will, we will be, here to, to try to answer, okay? So let's summarize our conclusions now. Considering Brazil today, what can we conclude about the long period of Portuguese colonization related to education? The first thing, Brazil is the country with the largest Catholic population in the world. However, the Catholic Church has been losing followers to other Christian churches, in, uh, especially in these two last decades. Uh, uh, these other Christian churches uh, have been growing in Brazil in these recent, recent decades. This growth occurs even among the indigenous population. This is the most interesting uh, concerning to this subject. Uh, uh, large um, number of indigenous people now in Brazil, they are moving to, from Catholicism to, to these other um, Christian churches. This growth occurs, as I said, among, even among the indigenous people which today represents 0.40% uh, uh, of the Brazilian population. Uh, in 2018, 32% of the indigenous populations declared themselves evangelical. And the most surprising thing in this census, the uh, demographic census in Brazil, was the fact that they have been evangelized by indigenous uh, uh, priests. So indigenous uh, in, in their territory uh, evangelize, are now evangelize, evangelizing the indigenous uh, themselves. Uh, a survey uh, showed in 2014 Show, showed that 81% of the Brazilian population had been raised Catholic, but only 61% remained Catholic that same year. In 2020, the country registered 
50% of Catholics and 32% of Evangelicals. The Catholic Church exerts a great influence on the country's political, social, and culture life. However, this Catholic hegemony must be minimized because of the opposite practices uh, in the religious syncretism, syncretism that marked the Christianization of Brazil since the Jesuits. As we have shown, practices, uh, opposite practices to Vatican dogmas and prescriptions were largely ignored in Brazil. Afterwards, with the strong African cultural influence, Brazilian Catholicism incorporated new practices that opposed the Catholicism prescribed by the Roman authorities. For example, several divine African figures or traditions are equivalent to saints of the Catholic Church in Brazil, and all people celebrated, and everyone celebrated these this, uh, African divines and traditions in the same days of the Saint uh, Catholics celebrated. So, in our view, I mean, for me and Amarillo, yes, please. Yes. For example, it's very, very common in Brazil, Catholic people uh, participate in the African religions and at the, the same time the, in the mass in the Sunday. It's very, it's very, very common, the, the Brazilian people. Yes, yes, thank you, Amarillo. We used to say that we go, we generally go to the mass in the morning and in the afternoon we practice African uh, divines and the culture. Yes, this is very, very common. Uh, so, uh, in our view and the resulting from our studies, uh, we believe that this characteristic shape that Catholicism has taken on in Brazil explains why we are the largest Catholic country in the world, but the Catholic world has never had a Brazilian Pope. We have now um, the, a, a Jesuit Pope uh, from Argentina, but we have we never had a Brazilian Pope. And now the second uh, conclusion: the delay in building a state system of schools for everyone in Brazil. In the 210 years of operation in Brazil, the Jesuits have built a solid and coherent system of education. But after catechesis, this system mostly served the, the white Brazilian elite. So due, due to this system, uh, the Jesuits delayed the state's obligation to build and maintain a universal educational system of schools for all Brazilian children and young people. It was only after 1930 that the constructions of the Brazilian educational system had an impulse. Brazil arrived in 1950 with almost 40% of its adult population illiterate and with few primary schools, especially in the um, uh, remote regions of Brazil, not in the coast, not in uh, in São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, or Minas Gerais, but uh, in the Brazil as a whole, we had a very few primary uh, schools at that time. So this this explains uh, why we uh, we arrived in 1950 with almost our uh, 40 percent of our adult population illiterate. 
and this uh, this had a relation to Paulo Freire method because Paulo Freire elaborated his method just in uh, in, in the 50s uh, to 60s. Well, the third conclusion, which is very present now in academic debates, so taking place uh, in Brazil today, is the last the lasting influence of Christianity on Brazilian pedagogical thought. Catholic thought in Brazil was totally predominant until 1930. After that, it polarized with the new school. I mean, we mean the thinking of um, John Dewey, yeah? uh, it, which had, had uh, um, an, an influence here in Brazil. But um, Catholic thought, even when new school um, started to influence here, Catholic thought continue to be one of the most influential thoughts. In recent years, the pedagogical thought most in evidence in Brazil has been that of Paulo Freire. So until now, the greatest Brazilian educator is a Catholic one, Paulo Freire. He was critical of the Brazilian elite but also a result of the Jesuit heritage. So we have, uh, we have this third conclusion, uh, which links the Catholic thought in Brazil with the with the Paulo Freire method. Then now we have uh, some images. These images we have here, they, they came from stamps and uh, um, prints. And uh, here, uh, the first moment yeah, between indigenous people and the Europeans. Engraving of our first mass in April, uh, just when the, the Portuguese arrived. This, this was in the pre-colonial period, so before the Jesuits arrived here, because this period, uh, it started from when the Portuguese arrived to 1530, and the Jesuits came on 1549. The Society of Jesus was created uh, in Europe. Here we can see the two most important uh, priests uh, in, in our co colonization. Here, uh, priest Manuel da Nobrega, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, priest Manuel da Nobrega, we, we say that Nobrega was the, the political of uh, uh, the, the company of Jesus. He planned everything. He planned all the actions. He was, uh, as the Jesuit says, he was the mentor of the the, the Jesus, the Society of Jesus in Brazil. He, so, Manu yes. He wrote the plan of the Brazilian colonization. It's very, very important intellectual European in Brazil in the first century of the Portuguese colonization. It's very, very cerebral man. It's very, very important the, because the plan of the colonization, the plan of the colonization wrote of the Manuel da Nóbrega. Yes, yes, thank you, Amarilha. Yes, Manuel da Nóbrega, yes, he was the planner. He was the intellectual and the political name, the biggest strategist, name. Strategist, strategist. Yes, yes, strategist, yes. This is the name, yes, correct. And uh, José de Anchieta was, uh, as Alfredo Bosi, Alfredo Bosi is a, a, an important author, 
he wrote the dialectic of uh, colonization in Brazil, and he, Alfredo Bos, he defines José de Anchieta as our first militant intellectual. Militant because he was, uh, he was with the indigenous people, catechizing, uh, teaching, and uh, doing, uh, um, doing even clothes for them, um, and everything. So Anchieta was the priest who was uh, uh, everywhere in the, every moment with the indigenous. And so he is our, maybe the first um, schoolmaster and the Nobrega, the strategist. É, Anchieta, Marisa, please. Anchieta, it's, uh, it's a very, very important intellectual. Don't, don't Portuguese, but the original, the, the Spain. But, but uh, Anchieta, uh, a large now landed in the grammar, grammar in the Greek, Latin, Spanish, Portuguese. E, e Anchieta is the, the intellectual, this production, the make it, um, made the, the the first grammar, 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 uh, to be grammar, and the dictionary, bilingue, bilingue. It's Portuguese in, 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 the, in the other side, in the uh, to be, uh, it, 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 uh, he used it, the, uh, the grammar, uh, Neo-Latin, it's a vocabulary, it's uh, Latin. Yes, Amarillo, yes, it's important to clarify that Anchieta was an expert in languages in general. He was born in Spain, right? and then when he came here, he quickly um, learned uh, to be language, and uh, although, and in his, in his, he wrote the, his plays in these three languages, Tupi, Nengatu, Portuguese, and one transgression that is very important to, to, uh, to understand was that the, the Jesuits in, in, in general, they refused to use the Latin language and they always prefer to use uh, Tupi language or the Portuguese, which predominated uh, in, from 18th century and from now. And, and so, yes, may, may I go? May I pass? Imaginated the Nyangatu language without uh, Anchieta. Yes, yes, because in Yengatu was a general language of all who lived in the Brazilian coast, and it was a mix from Tupi and the Portuguese. And the Anchieta uh, took a, good, uh, a special uh, player in, in, this, in, in this kind of... Uh, so, grammar, um, theater, and he wrote the first to be dictionary. Uh, dictionary, yes. Uh, yes, here a farm, of course, it's a print, no? uh, and a Jesuit with the indigenous people here, and here a sugar uh, where they produce uh, uh, sugar here before sent to, to Europe. Here we can see uh, slave labor, né? when uh, Africans uh, started to be uh, majority related to the Indian people. Well, I think now, now uh, we finish. That's it from us. And please, if you have questions, if we may discuss something that interests you, I, I don't know if I made myself clear. Here is uh, uh, one a place 
uh, where Gary visited in 2013 our university, Universidade Federal de São Carlos. Thank you. <laughs> Splendid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marissa and, uh, and uh, Maria.